Thank you for checking out our YouTube channel and don't forget to subscribe and like. And please visit us at barrykibrick.com where you'll see all the ways that you can become a patron of our mission and help us continue to build a community of seekers who quest for knowledge, information, and most importantly, wisdom. What is it about our curiosity that would allow us to risk our lives to venture into the unknown of outer space? Welcome, I'm Barry Kibrick, and few people can explain that better than my guest, Rod Pyle. Rod is a renowned space author, journalist, and historian who worked with NASA and JPL. And with his latest book, Space 2.0, we'll see why we must continue our journey into the last frontier, for it literally may save our lives. Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible in part by Patreon. Patreon helps creators build and run membership businesses. From podcasters to writers, musicians, artists, and more. With tools that allow their fans to become patrons. More information is available at patreon.com. And Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is also made possible by the following contributors. A complete list of funders is available at barrykibrick.com. Rod, it is always a pleasure to have you on Between the Lines. This book especially is groundbreaking as far as I'm concerned. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me back. I appreciate it. Uh, it's always my pleasure. And I want to start off with this. We have not transported humans beyond Earth's orbit since 1972. That is simply not good enough. Yeah, it's true. Um, there's a couple of things that work there. One of them is we, and it's a little unfair in a way because we've done a lot on low Earth orbit. So I just wanted to make the point of how remarkable it is that we haven't done that, even though we have achieved many things in orbit. So the shuttle served us for 30 years plus, 135 flights. We have a remarkable space station flying overhead every 90 minutes that a lot of people don't know very much about. Tons of work is done there, a lot of research towards extended space flight and so forth. But the missions that you and I grew up with, that period of time during the space race, when as often as every 10 weeks, there were these amazing missions of exploration taking off for other worlds, was really inspiring in a way that I don't think space flight has been since then. Well, you know, so that was my point. Well, the words you use is the bounty to be reaped from a truly robust presence in space is impossible to overstate. And in the book, when people will read this, we don't even have the smallest notion of how much the space projects that we do benefit us on Earth. It's a bounty that can't, oh, I'll repeat it again, the bounty to be reaped, it's there. It is, and, and it's a hard message to get across. It's something NASA's been struggling with since the Apollo program, is trying to get the, the notion across to the broader public of how much this benefits us all. Some of it's kind of invisible, some of it's very obvious. If you look at studies, for every dollar put in the Apollo program, $14 came back in the economy one way or the other. Uh, the direct benefits, things like dialysis machines, the computer in your cell phone, there's a whole list, you know, and they publish these things every year in a publication called Spinoffs. But it just doesn't, the message doesn't get across the broader public of how important this is. And then when you start looking out forward from today in this second space age that we're talking about, the benefits are going to start accruing just exponentially. It's a, it's a huge, huge subject. Well, but you start off with these words, space hates people. <laughs> I love that one. Don't yeah. let that put you off, though. But it, we really aren't designed to be in space. So, and we, we've yeah. got the two things you mentioned most, and, and there's many other reasons, but it's the absence of gravity, obviously the air, we can't breathe it, and the space radiation, those three things. But space hates us, and we're supposed to love space. It is kind of a... Well, what do you want to call it? I don't want to even call it a contradiction because it's true that we benefit so much from knowing about it. 
It's a love-hate relationship. You know, when, when I was a kid, the, the solar system was a much kinder place because we just didn't know very much about it. So when you were talking about terrestrial planets, let's say from Venus through Earth to Mars, we thought they were going to be different, but we didn't think they were going to be as hellishly different as they are. So Venus, 900 degrees, about 1,000 PSI of atmospheric pressure, sulfur, uh, uh, acid in the atmosphere, sulfuric acid in the rain. It's a rotten place. We're probably never going to go there. We might spend some time up in the upper atmosphere in, in floating stations, but we're probably never going to go to the surface. Mars, different story. It's the most, most Earth-like place in the solar system, but it's very cold. Atmosphere is very thin. You know, we used to think it might be kind of a shirt sleeve environment. You'd need an oxygen bottle and a parka, you know, and everything would be fine. Not only is it, is it cold and, and uh, the tons of radiation on the surface, but even the soil hates you there. There's perchlorates in the soil, so you can't even breathe the dust without making yourself sick. So the solar system became a lot more hostile as we began sending robots out to explore it. So you always then say the own qu your own question is, why do we keep going? And it is due to this endless curiosity that we, and literally may end up saving our lives eventually, but why do we keep going? And the big argument right now is why aren't we just sending robots versus right. sending humans? And we all know that humans do still, could they, they, if they see a rock, they don't have to get programmed to go get the rock. They can get the rock and move it. But there is, the you have to weigh the costs. You have so many variables mm -hmm. go into space. It's true, and, and that argument is evolving. So you only get so far with the philosophical arguments of man must explore, you know, kind of the classic humanity must move beyond. We have to see beyond the next mountain. We have scientific curiosity. These things are all important and matter to an awful lot of us, but when you're trying to sell the message to the general public and you're talking about taxpayer dollars, that begins to become difficult. I think what's going to shift in this new space age that we're entering and, and I'm going to arbitrarily put that pivot point at the launch of the Falcon Heavy because that was a spectacular moment where this admittedly eccentric billionaire said, I'm going to build rockets and I'm going to build a really big one and it's going to work the first time. And Elon Musk made that happen and we saw the Falcon Heavy launch last year. I think that really telegraphed the message there's this new era here and what's going to drive that new era very soon is commerce and profit and capitalism, and that's something we've never seen in space before. A little bit with the satellite and telecommunications industry, but now we're talking about mining the moon, we're talking about mining asteroids for resources, both for, for rare earth elements and precious metals that we may bring home, but most importantly, for water and other things that we can use in space, so we don't have to transport all that stuff up there anymore, which is terribly expensive. Once you can find those things in space, including metals for doing 3D manufacturing of components for rockets and habitats and so forth, the solar system's at your, at your door. The other thing that, that you mentioned about what I, I, I mean, we're going to talk about all of the, the entrepreneurs. We're going to talk about Jeff Bezos. We're going to talk about uh, Bronson and a few others. But I want to talk once more about Elon because he is the pioneer of the pioneers, mm -hmm. in my opinion. One of the other things that people don't realize is is that what, what he's hoping for is this ability to get us up out of the atmosphere so that literally, and these are your words, we can go from New York to Shanghai, China in 40 minutes. That's a pretty good enough reason right there to explore all of these space options. And like you said, this is all done through meat and potato capitalism. This is, and in fact, there's now large in mutual funds all based on you can invest in this. And by the way, when you read this book, you think, I got to start putting some money into space. Yes. I'm, I, am, I, am I right? Yes, you are. And, and that particular chapter you're talking about was split between an investment fund called Space Angels, which is on the smaller side. I mean, still in the millions, but on the smaller side investment. And a gentleman named Steve Jurvetson, who's invested hundreds of millions in these operations. And uh, he was the guy who stepped in and bailed out SpaceX he probably wouldn't want me to use the word bailout, but he was the guy who gave a big infusion of cash to SpaceX in 2008, 2009, when they were really struggling to get their first rocket to fly into orbit. And interviewing him was such a blast. He's just brilliant. This guy got through Stanford Engineering School in two and a half years by 
kind of gaming the admissions computer system, which I went there, I tried to do that, and I couldn't, I could barely figure out how to register for classes, so he's that smart. <laughs> so he's, you know, he's been approached by a lot of companies, he, he put a lot of money in SpaceX, and he's been one of the pioneers in showing that there is a profit to be made here, and very soon. Now, one of the others that I want to bring up is Jeff Bezos, because what makes Jeff Bezos very interesting, he's the head of Amazon, is he's using and my God, this is the thing they tell you never to do. Right. He's using his own capital yeah. to do this. So here's a guy who, who literally puts his money where his mouth is. So the, the uh, people that supported this book, the National Space Society held a conference last year. They were, they were the co-publisher of uh, this book. And we had Bezos there as a keynote speaker. And I had never met him before. I kind of knew what he was doing, but he gave this wonderful talk, and as you were pointing out, he puts his own money into it to the tune of a billion dollars a year, which means he's, he's got to sell stock to do that. He'll only be able to do that for another 150 years or so, but this is more than a <laughs> hobby, you know? This is really believing in what you do, and his vision's a little different than Musk's. Musk is looking to, in the, at the end of the day, he wants to put a backup of humanity on Mars. He wants our civilization expanded to Mars for various reasons, including safety, so should something happen on Earth. Bezos has a slightly more organic view of this, which is, he, and he enunciated this in his valedictorian speech in 1982, by the way, graduating high school, um, before he became this incredible power that he is now. He wants to move heavy industry off of Earth he wants to move a lot of the people that are doing the work off of Earth and let Earth recover into this pristine state it was before we arrived at the Industrial Revolution. And beyond that, he wants people living and working in space to do what they do best. There's a conversation to be had there about where do the machines stop and where do the people begin because you do have to send machines first. They will always go where it's most dangerous because as we talked about earlier, we're bags of, of meat, water, and muscle. You know, and it's very difficult and expensive to keep us alive in space. Machines don't care. They go out there, they roast the radiation, they're happy all day. So they're <laughs> going to do the early exploration. They're going to do the dangerous stuff. They're going to build some of the infrastructure, which is a real key part of this book is talking about infrastructure. And then people will go and it makes sense to do so. But here's what you just were going where I want to go because part of the obstacle I believe in getting the funding and that's why I'm glad we're seeing the capitalists get involved in it is because when we look at our infrastructure on earth it's crumbling every that's every politician is letting you know our earth's infrastructure is crumbling and I don't mean environmentally I mean the fact that our internets are not as up to date as many of the other places our our highways all of that so it's hard to then say we need to build the infrastructure in space that's always been this great dichotomy well why aren't we doing everything to do on earth and and that's where i think nasa has been bat i think you said since the 50s they've been battling that battle well you know how do you convince people that wait a minute this space program is worth every dime you even showed us how for 14 dollar return on the investment for every dollar spent but it's still it's hard for people to comprehend here on the planet yeah, and I think we need to update that conversation from Apollo because that was a long time ago and some of that doesn't resonate with people anymore. So you need to talk about what the coming benefits are and what are some of those coming, coming benefits. Uh, there's a variety of them. One of the ones that's talked about quite a bit, and again, the, the National Space Society really pushes this agenda, is solar power from space. So we've got a real problem here with energy. Every time we generate energy, we foul the atmosphere, we pollute the water, we deplete our resources. It would not be, it's, it's, it's not an engineering stretch anymore. It's a matter of scaling it up and making it happen, investing. But putting an orbital platform or a series of orbital platforms up that are solar collection farms that convert sunlight into energy and beam it down to Earth is just a matter of, of scaling up your investment in the technology. Now you've got virtually limitless clean power coming down 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and you are weaning yourself off fossil fuels and you're doing the planet and humanity a big favor. That's just one facet of this kind of thing, and that's infrastructure. <laughs> But as I, as I, and you said, we, we, we know there's a problem. There is the sense of human survival. Now, we talked about 
Elon Musk believing that we need to live in Mars because in case there's something that happens here, mm -hmm. or if, whether it's global warming, whatever issue it might be. But the truth is, one of the key things we know we have to be concerned about, because it has happened in the past, are the asteroids and the meteorites that can definitely, even though we want to mine some of those asteroids, some of them we have to be ready to knock them off course, or we may experience the dinosaur age. I mean, you know, that's mm -hmm. what, what happened. Uh, we don't want that. So that in alone, you'd think, would say, come on, folks, get on the ball to let's put some money where, like Jeff does, his mouth is, and say, we need this because we may have to knock an asteroid. And by the way, to knock an asteroid off as, out of space is not as, that, depending on how you do it, there's some very bad ways, but there's also giving it a little nudge. That's the nice thing about space. You give something a nudge, and it can, <laughs> holy mackerel, it can go from, I mean, a span of, of what, what did you use the example of Mars? Where to get the energy to get out of our own atmosphere is the same as it takes to get from our atmosphere to Mars. Or just about anywhere else. Or yeah. anywhere else. That's, it's, yeah. it's easy to move once you're in space. So, so you're talking about planetary defense, right? Right. You want to defend the Earth from, because we live in a shooting gallery. Hasn't happened for a long time. We've had smaller ones like Chelyabinsk in Russia a couple years ago. That was only about 60 feet across and that was the size of a nuclear weapon, a large nuclear weapon. So when you start talking about asteroids that are hundreds and hundreds of meters across or miles across, you got serious problems, and some of these are extinction level events for, for the human race, because it doesn't take that much as it turns out, even if it falls in the ocean, to really foul up the atmosphere enough that crops begin to fail. You don't have to move things very many degrees before you have crop failures, and we live in a just-in-time economy when it comes to agriculture and crops. So we really don't want that to happen. So in the Obama administration, they upped the budget for planetary defense activities by a factor of about 10, which is a good start. Still not enough. In the book, I interview Lori Garver, who was the deputy administrator at NASA during that time. And she said, you know, we achieved a lot, but we have a lot more to do. We need orbiting observatories to spot and identify these things. And we need to start figuring out ways to interdict them because we don't know how to do that yet. There is one NASA program scheduled for the 2020s called DART, the Double Asteroid Redirection Test, which very simply is sending a spacecraft out towards this. There's an asteroid called Didymos, and it has a little moon going around it called Didy Moon. Isn't that cute? And it's just big enough for this test. So they're going to slam this spacecraft into Didy Moon and watch it from telescopes and see how much that deflects. And it's the very first tiny step towards this idea of deflecting asteroids. You need to get them when they're way out there, because you remember your geometry, you know, if you, further away it is, this, the, the deflection doesn't need to be very big to get them to not hit Earth. So we've got various plans to do that. Uh, they, they involve everything from impactors to one of the plans, which I love, is spraying one side of the astronaut with white, uh, the, of the asteroid with white paint because it reflects light in a different way and that actually gives a little bit of propulsive force. The Russians, in their typically kind of brute force approach to things, are going to, they're at least talking about sending up a nuclear warhead, not to explode the, the asteroid, but to heat up one side of it sufficiently that as material comes off of it, it propels itself off course, which is very smart thinking. So one way or the other, we need to figure out how to do this. But getting people to invest in those what-if dangers, as you know, especially governments, is a tough call. Well, this is why, again, the, 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 it's kind of nice. We have now a dual space race. We have it between the capitalists, and we mentioned Richard Branson's involved mm -hmm. in it as well. We even, I want to bring up something else because there's even, people don't think it, but there's sort of garage band <laughs> uh, re, people playing with this. People literally in small places sending up what the word is femtosats. Right, right. So what is, the, we're talking about like little things that they're actually sending into orbit. What are they doing with these little things? Are these, observe, are they able to observe? Are they, what, what are these things? And it seems like it's really coming from what we'll call garage band entrepreneurs, guys that, you know, jobs that started in the garage with his computer. These guys are starting in small spaces for small objects going into big spaces. 
So this, this whole area is called collectively small sats. Uh, cube sats are part of it, nanosats, femtosats, just getting smaller and smaller in size. I, I write a publication for JPL every year about their, their technical and engineering achievements. And one of the things you re realize very quickly when you're working on that is that they're using more off-the-shelf components than ever. Things are getting smaller. They require less power, which means they require uh, smaller power supplies. So everything's getting lighter and smaller and more compact, which is great because then instead of launching one satellite the size of a compact car up into orbit with a single rocket launch, you're launching dozens or sometimes, case of an Indian launch a couple years ago, over a hundred satellites in a single launch. Uh, so a company like Planet Labs, which is featured in the book, years ago started using these small CubeSats to do Earth observation. So they're in lower orbits, they go over every, every 90 minutes or a couple of hours, and they're able to give you these, these frequently refreshed images of what's going on to the point that if I work at Target and it's Black Friday and I want to see how many people are parked in the Walmart parking lot, I can subscribe to this service and I can see the pictures in practically real time. So that's one application. In the next couple of years, we're going to go from, I think there's under 2,000 operating major satellites right now in orbit, in the next decade or so, we're going to be going up to tens of thousands because SpaceX and a number of other companies are going to be orbiting these constellations of tiny communication satellites that are going to beam broadband signals back and forth so that everybody from sub-Saharan Africa to Norway is going to have this high-speed internet access. And when you start thinking about how many people that brings into the global conversation that aren't there now, talk about benefits from space, how many Einsteins are living in sub-Saharan Africa that we don't know about just because they don't have access to education and communication? It's a whole different world. It seems like the ultimate goal of this Space 2.0 could literally be the vastest cooperation that humanity's ever seen. Well, I'd like to think so. Buzz Aldrin would agree with you. He's a big advocate of internationalism. I was talking to Chad Anderson with that investment firm, Space Angels, that I was discussing before, and he used the word coopetition, which I hadn't heard before. So one example of that is Jeff Bezos with Blue Origin. His company is building one of the largest rocket engines we've seen in a long time, 550,000 pounds of thrust, about a third of what the engines of the first stage of the Saturn V generated, but still a huge engine. And it's reusable, so that's a big deal. Well, he decides, you know what? I don't need to use this for just my rockets. I'll sell them to United Launch Alliance, which is a, a partnership of Boeing and Lockheed that launches rockets and has been since we started building ICBMs back in the 50s. So he's actually selling to his future competition, but he figures that's okay because it's all going to work out. Well, also, uh, uh, you said the word internationalism. Uh, I almost, when you hear that, sometimes you think of one world government. Mm. I wasn't meaning that, and I don't think Buzz Aldrin is either. No, no, no. What we're talking about, though, is this cooperation yes. between the governments. That's what the beauty is. It's not that we're, 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 and by the way, what makes it so great is it's always with a little competition. So you have this competition and cooperation, that's, that's almost a new paradigm, that's almost a paradigm shift in the way humanity thinks. It, it will be, and, and, and I, I hope it will happen soon. Um, it's something that we have tried before with the International Space Station, that was an international cooperative effort. More than half of it was paid by the United States, and most of the heavy lifting was done by space shuttles, so it was a little lopsided, but it did work, and it did make it more affordable for us. Arguably, it made it a little more complicated because of international agreements, but it did work. I think the, the magic here for the future is in finding the sweet spot between NASA, which is going to be the world's leading space agency for some time to come, although China's nipping at their heels in some areas, and the private sector, so SpaceX and Blue Origin, the United Launch Alliance, and North of Grumman and so forth, all those old school aerospace companies are really stepping up their game because SpaceX, right? And then and the third component is the international space agencies and companies. So there's a, a sweet spot here somewhere of cooperation between those three entities that makes access to orbit more affordable, that makes being in space more affordable, but as you say, there's still an element of competition, and it's not just commercial competition, there's still national pride to be dealt with here. And NASA issued a white paper a couple of years ago, uh, excuse me, China issued a white paper a couple of years ago talking about their space plans, and they were very candid about it. They said, this is for the 
largely for the benefit and the prestige of the nation. I'm glad they came out and said it because I want to know that. But those things will all continue to drive, and I hope it just drives it into a spot that's good for everybody. Well, Rod, as you say, Space 2.0 is upon us. Our adventure in the universe beyond our Earth is just beginning. Thank you, my friend, thank for you. starting us on that new beginning. And thank you all for joining us to listen to my podcast, which has additional content that we didn't have time for on our broadcast. Search for Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick on your favorite podcast provider. And to comment or ask me anything about our show, visit our website at barrykibrick.com. And you can also email me at barry at barrykibrick.com, and I promise to personally respond. But before we go, I'd like to leave you with these words by Rod Pyle. Space exploration is about curiosity. It is about the drive to understand the unknown. It is about pride, human achievement, and bettering ourselves. It is about the very survival of humanity. I'm Barry Kibrick. Between the smallest particle and the vastness of space, human achievement is all about curiosity. Stay curious and someday we will understand the unknowable. Thank you, Rod. Thank you. My pleasure. To become part of the Between the Lines family, go to barrykibrick.com. There you can join our book club, participate in Q&As, catch past episodes, listen to Barry's podcasts, read his blog, and experience exclusive online features, all at barrykibrick.com. Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible in part by Patreon. Patreon helps creators build and run membership businesses, from podcasters to writers, musicians, artists, and more, with tools that allow their fans to become patrons. More information is available at patreon.com. And Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is also made possible by the following contributors. A complete list of funders is available at barrykibrick.com.